This talk is about surgical professionalism and the question I would like to address is whether in the face of the massive changes which have occurred in the delivery of health care, in teaching and in research over the past few decades, whether professionalism has managed to keep pace and is it really necessary in this modern digital age to maintain professionalism in the delivery of health care and if so why or is this a rather outdated old-fashioned remnant of a bygone era? We all accept that when medicine and indeed surgery was basic, professionalism was key and was often the only way and the only thing that a doctor could offer. This is shown rather beautifully in this famous painting by the great Victorian artist Luke Files. Here we see a little girl who is dying, probably with diphtheria, the distraught parents can only look on in anguish. Now look at the doctor. His very presence and professional aura oozes sympathy, oozes empathy and compassion even though he is unable to do anything. As surgery and indeed medicine in general has become more advanced and increasingly technologically based as well as increasingly specialised, there is this growing perception that authentic professionalism of this type is being squeezed out of surgical practice, in part due to the dis disproportionate emphasis now being placed on target-driven, on competitive and on commissioned delivery of health care. To support this, just look at the number of reports and inquiries which have been conducted into almost every aspect uh, of medical professionalism. Surely this is an illustration of how doctors' professionalism is now being portrayed by society, the latest report being the new law relating to consent. Let us first of all try to define what we mean by medical professionalism. A few years ago, the Royal College of Physicians set up a working party to debate medical professionalism and to formulate an appropriate definition. After some two years of intensive deliberation with numerous meetings and working parties, well you know what physicians are like, they came up with the following. Medical professionalism signifies a set of values, behaviours and relationships that underpin the trust the public has in doctors. I have deliberately highlighted the word trust in this definition. Surgeons have a responsibility to maintain the highest level of patient trust in all that they do. This includes not only the trust that a patient has in their doctor, but also the trust the public have in the profession. It is this aspect, the maintenance of trust in the profession, which in my view is absolutely paramount. Inevitably, following every occasion of adverse publicity, trust in the profession is dealt a nasty blow. Sadly, rarely a month passes without some negative headlines involving the adverse professionalism of surgeons. Even the Lancet has got into the act. A recent editorial stated that surgeons lack professionalism, claiming surgery is a specialty adrift. Let us delve a little deeper into the Royal College of Physicians' definition and findings. Surgical professionalism is multifactorial. It demands three factors, obviously knowledge and skills, but also acceptable conduct and behaviour, integrity and morality, as well as the promotion of the public good. These ingredients should be reflected not only in the way surgeons perform, but in their speech, in their communication, in their behaviour in public, and dare I say it, even in dress. You cannot pick and choose. All three of these ingredients are relevant and essential for professionalism in medicine. Now with this background, I would like to consider the present situation with regard to surgical professionalism from three standpoints. First of all, is there a problem? Secondly, if there is a problem, can lapses in professionalism be recognised, pre preferably at an early stage, in other words, diagnosis? And finally, what about treatment? How can the slippery slope be gritted? So firstly, is there a problem? 
Now, we ought to be able to answer this with absolute confidence and certainty. After all, we have enough regulators monitoring and collecting data regarding doctors' activities. At my last count, there were some 24 different bodies, and here we have some of them. We have NHS organisations, treatment regulators, and our own professional regulator, the much maligned General Medical Council. Let us focus, first of all, on data available in the public domain from the General Medical Council. I have chosen the GMC because for 10 years I was a medical case examiner in the Fitness to Practice Directorate of the General Medical Council and during that time I was personally involved in the investigation of some 4,500 doctors who were referred to the GMC because of allegations against their fitness to practice, in other words, allegations relating to lapsed professionalism. Now, in the last 10 years, there has been a significant doubling of the number of doctors referred to the fitness to practice directorate of the GMC because of concerns over their professionalism. Approximately 5,000 in 2007 and approaching 10,000 referrals per year at present. If this rate of referral were to continue, it is estimated that one in 40 of all doctors will at some time in their careers be referred to the GMC. One can only imagine the total sum of de despair, depression and general distress that this must add up to, let alone the effects on family and personal relationships. There have been 26 suicides amongst doctors facing fitness to practice investigations in the last five years. And this has resulted in a GMC inquiry conducted by Professor Appleby from Manchester into the whole process of investigation. He has made a number of sensible recommendations to try and reduce the number and intensity of investigations and expedite the process and I'll be coming back to this a little later. Now with regard to specialties, GPs are by far the largest single group re undergoing referral followed by surgeons. All surgical specialties are represented but the largest single group are plastic surgeons. Here we have the outcomes of investigations in 2015. Of 2,808 completed investigations, in over 80% of cases these were closed with no action other than perhaps advice, but this took an average of over one year to achieve, which is far too long. Between 2009 and 2015, 40 surgeons were erased from the medical register for fitness to practice issues, in other words, for seriously lapsed professionalism. In 2016, five surgeons were erased. Now, if one accepts that this data from the GMC is a surrogate marker of impaired professionalism, then one has to try and explain why this is occurring. The immediate knee-jerk response is that the increase in referrals to the regulator represents deteriorating practice, deteriorating attitudes, and a general deterioration in professionalism. However, when one has obtained quantitative data of this kind, one must be very careful with its interpretation, especially when trying to establish a link between a cause and an effect. And this is a message which our politicians have difficulty in accepting, especially when speaking about health matters. And the seven-day NHS, I believe, is a case in point. So are there alternative explanations to account for the increase in referrals to the GMC. I believe there are. Firstly, there is an undoubted change in public attitude towards doctors. We must accept that the concept of societal indifference is becoming increasingly challenged as the public becomes better informed and more assertive. There is increased access to health information and much better media scrutiny now than ever before. Patients are increasingly unwilling to accept clinical judgments in a passive manner. Increased referrals from members of the public 
are therefore inevitable and represent some 60% of all referrals. Secondly, an uncomfortable fact is that colleagues are much more likely to refer colleagues now than ever before. This route of referral has doubled in the last three years. The change in attitude is of course related to the politically correct principle of encouraging whistleblowing. Surgeons of course have a professional responsibility for raising concerns about colleagues which if not dealt with could affect patient safety. But these concerns must be based on evidence and when raised should initially be subjected to a detailed forensic investigation by the Trust to establish whether the allegations are serious and if so whether there is evidence to support them. Sadly in my experience Concerns brought to the attention of trust management are often not subjected to proper, effective local investigation with the result that relatively trivial and in some cases, dare I say, vexatious allegations are increasingly being referred to the GMC. Let me quote from the recently published Appleby report into the GMC, which uh, I referred to earlier. Appleby states that employers should end uh, the use of GMC referral to resolve conflicts with medical staff. In support of this, less than 10% of GMC referrals reach a fitness to practice panel and 50% of referrals are dismissed by the GMC without even bothering to investigate the allegations because they are too trivial. Thirdly, we all recognise the improved clinical governance and management systems which now exist within our trust. But as mentioned, this is combined with a reluctance of the very same trusts to investigate any identified concerns locally with a managerial preference for GMC referral. So is professionalism really deteriorating or are we now experiencing better systems of detection and a lower threshold for referral to the regulator? I believe these are more likely explanations for the significant increase in GMC referrals. I also believe that much of the etiology for the apparent lapsed professionalism can be explained by conflicts, stresses and strains which occur within the workplace at a time when surgeons are subjected to overwhelming scrutiny and regulation of all their activities. The conflicts can be divided into three categories. Firstly, there is a conflict between evidence-based medicine on the one hand and the erosion of individual judgment on the other, especially when individual judgment and surgical wisdom are regarded as being integral to professionalism. Many surgeons are exhausted and suffering from what I refer to as the guideline fatigue syndrome. Guideline production is now becoming an industry and if anything has increased with commissioning. Secondly, there is a conflict between paternalism, which is the traditional way in which medicine has been practiced, where it was automatically accepted that the doctor knows best, and the present day requirement for autonomy and a partnership between the patient and doctor. No decision about me without me, with an increasing willingness of patients to question both clinical and non-clinical decisions with a knock-on effect of doctors becoming increasingly defensive. This is now exacerbated by the new law on patient consent. And thirdly, we have the conflict between a team management approach to patient care which is now the norm and accountability. Multidisciplinary team management is a key component of contemporary surgical care and so it should be. But who is actually in charge and responsible for the patient? This is particularly important in an era of shift working and handovers. Surgeons must not abrogate their responsibilities towards a patient. A consultant surgeon must remain in charge and be responsible for all patients in his or her care, irrespective 
of the multidisciplinary structure. Patients want and need to identify with a single individual for direction and discussion. This is the essence of trust and professionalism and must not be lost irrespective of external dogma. Now, having considered the problem, let us move on to consider the diagnostic conundrum. How can lapses in professionalism be recognised? We know that in many surgical disorders, the earlier a diagnosis is made, the more likely it is to be cured. Similarly, the earlier that lapses in professionalism can be recognised, the easier and more successful remediation becomes with obvious benefits to the surgeon and of course to patients. Lapses can occur in performance as well as in conduct and behaviour, but more often it is a combination of the two. Let us first consider performance issues. All surgeons have made serious clinical errors, which have resulted in significant patient mortality and morbidity. We are all human. But is the error an unfortunate isolated event in an otherwise unblemished career, or does it represent a pattern of poor performance? That is a question. However, when an error does occur, a full and sincere apology to the patient or family is required. This is the appropriate professional response and has clearly been enunciated in the GMC duty of, do of Candor document. Let me quote. If a patient under your care has suffered harm or distress, you must act immediately to put matters right if that is possible. You should offer an apology and explain fully and promptly to the patient what has happened and the likely short-term and long-term effects. Now, to distinguish between an isolated error and a pattern of poor performance, surgeons must be able to provide documentary evidence that they achieve acceptable results with an appropriate standard of care. Accordingly, accurate collection of outcome data is now a professional requirement, not least of all because any allegation relating to a surgeon's performance can only be refuted when backed up by documented outcome evidence. Let us now consider lapses in the non-clinical professional attributes. The importance of maintaining the highest levels of integrity, of probity and behaviour cannot be overemphasised. It is no longer acceptable to be a maverick and proud of it, to be rude, to ignore the views of others, to bully or to harass junior staff or to unfairly, unfairly blame others for mistakes. When such concerns relating to conduct and behaviour are, are raised, they must be investigated and dealt with as soon as possible. Nevertheless, it is a sad fact of life that delays in dealing with unacceptable behaviour and conduct do occur, and this is due, in part, to the perpetuation of two myths. The first myth is the assumption that if a team has good results, a bit of bad behaviour is acceptable, and the second is that emer emerging problems relating to conduct and bad behaviour in general will go away if left alone. Now there is evidence to debunk both of these dangerous myths. With regard to the first myth, let us look at data from the Royal College of Surgeons Invited Review Mechanism, the IRM, where trusts request the college to investigate the performance of either an individual surgeon or a surgical service. When I chaired the Invited Review Mechanism Committee, we conducted a review of referred cases. 44% of cases referred to the IRM for investigation of performance concerns also had conduct and behaviour concerns identified and vice versa. It is unusual for, for concerns to be purely performance in nature there is almost always an element of systemic dysfunctional behaviour contributing to the poor performance. Similar data is available from NCAS, the National Clinical Assessment Service. 
In their first 50 cases investigated for performance concerns, 94% of surgeons were shown to have behavioural problems and 75% communication problems in addition to performance issues. So assuming a bit of bad behaviour is acceptable if a team is perceived to have good results is both unprofessionalism, uh, unprofessional and dangerous. The other myth that hoping emerging problems will go away if left alone is also without foundation. And the evidence debunking this can also be found in the IRM data. 78% of individual IRM reviews took place 12 or more months after the problem was first identified, whereas nearly half the individuals were identified as having performance and conduct issues within 12 months of appointment. So that hoping that professional problems will go away if left alone is without foundation and is dangerous. In my opinion, behavioural and conduct lapses by surgeons can be avoided if individuals would only recognise the importance of good communication skills and good interpersonal relationships both with patients and with colleagues. Communication of information to patients in a way that they understand is obviously important as indeed is providing an understanding of risk in a transparent fashion. In addition, poor interpersonal relationships between colleagues in the workplace is, I believe, the cause of much disharmony and impaired professionalism. Sadly, I have seen dozens of cases at the GMC in which conflicts due to poor interpersonal relationships between colleagues has developed into what I call the dysfunctional team scenario, an example of significant lapse professionalism. The classic sequence of events is as follows. A dispute develops in the team often relating to jealousy. Complaints to the trust from one member of the team occur and then the other member retaliates and eventually the case is referred to the GMC. Throughout this time there is a lack of engagement with managers and this results in dismissals, in suspensions, employment tribunals and eventually an increase in the frequency of serious untoward incidents. All these being extremely expensive outcomes and at the end of the day it is a patient who suffers. I have actually collected a list based on actual cases of what I call the non-professional don'ts, each of which escalated into serious litigation and fitness to practice issues. I would suggest that one should not publicly criticise a colleague, engage in malicious gossip, write abusive emails to colleague or management, criticise a colleague to a patient, undermine management in public and abuse social media. In fact, the GMC regards inappropriate use of social media as being definitely unprofessionalism. And now we come to gritting the slippery slope. What should be done once concerns have been raised with regard to lapsed professionalism. In my opinion, the major issues are insight and remorse. If a surgeon does not recognise that a problem exists either with clinical performance or with conduct and behaviour, it can be an extremely difficult situation to remediate. Only when the concerns presented are accepted and remorse shown can effective remediation take place. When dealing with specific low-level problems, wherever possible, a local or informal resolution is the most de desirable way forward. Annual appraisal should, if carried out properly, identify the deficits and once identified, further training, education and competence assessments uh, can be conducted locally. Resolution may simply require no more than a review of the surgeon's job plan or referral to occupational health. It may be a little old-fashioned, but also a word in your ear, in other words advice from a senior respected colleague, can rectify 
an awkward situation very frequently in an informal manner and prevent escalation. However, if high level concerns arise, particularly related to poor performance when patient safety is at risk, then immediate action is required. There is now a system within the General Medical Council of employer liaison advisors whom a trust can contact to act in a truly liaison capacity. The Royal College of Surgeons and specialty associations through the invited review mechanism can institute an investigation if requested to do so by the trust. NCAS looks at performance issues but the GMC is the final arbiter with regard to fitness of practice and there is a professional responsibility to refer if following a thorough local investigation evidence exists to demonstrate that high level serious concerns are present. So finally, what about solutions or should I say what prophylactic or preventative measures can be utilised to avoid lapses and to maintain high quality surgical professionalism? Let me list my personal proposals for prophylactic measures to try and prevent professional lapses. The first is supporting professional activity in job planning. This I believe is crucially important. There must be adequate time in a surgeon's hectic working week to devote to professional activities. Any attempt by employers to reduce supporting professional activity must be resisted. Normally for consultants there should be 2.5 SPA sessions per week in a 10 session job plan. As an example, a possible distribution might be time for keeping up to date, CPD and research for training and teaching, for trust management responsibilities, and indeed for appraisal. The British Medical Association carried out a survey of SBA sessions and reported that only 58% of consultants were receiving 2.5 SPAs in a 10 session contract. A similar review which I conducted in 142 surgeons showed that only 50% uh, received 2.5 SPAs. This data suggests that many surgeons do not have sufficient time in their job plan to support professional activity. I know this particularly in relation to undergraduate clinical teaching. This is to be regretted and is likely in the long term to have serious patient safety implications. The next prophylactic proposal relates to the introduction of formal mentorship during the early years of a consultant appointment. My first consultant appointment was as a senior lecturer in Liverpool. I was clinically independent but there was a professor of surgery and head of the department who in fact, who in effect acted as a mentor for me, not that I realised it at the time not to coach, not to teach surgical technique, but available to listen, to advise, to support, to encourage, to share experiences and to act as a signpost when necessary. I found this immensely helpful in those early days. This relationship is normal and accepted in academic university departments, so why shouldn't it exist in NHS institutions? My third proposal relates to making full use of the Royal College of Surgeons. I was an elected council member for 10 years and never ceased to be amazed by how much support the college provides to its members and fellows. It is my perception, however, that the outstanding available facilities are not fully utilised or indeed fully appreciated. There is now a strategy for supporting surgeons in the workplace involving directors of professional activity and, and regional specialty professional advisors attached to every region in the country so there is a college representative in every specialty who can be called upon to assist and to provide confidential professional advice if necessary. So many things have changed in recent years. Not only have televisions become thinner and the population become larger but also professionalism, as well as our health service, has required reconfiguration and realignment. 
However, to answer the question I proposed at the beginning of the talk, the basic principles of professionalism in healthcare still remain. We must ensure that the standards of care and trust which the public have every right to expect are maintained and wherever possible enhanced. It is my view that within the next 20 to 30 years, medicine and surgery will be unrecognisable as the professionals they are today. Even more of the jobs and responsibilities carried out by doctors at present will be performed by non-medical personnel as part of the multidisciplinary team structure. Individual professionalism will gradually be overtaken by team professionalism. Individual accountability for a patient is, in my opinion, in danger of being consigned to history. The question arises whether, despite this, doctors in general and surgeons in particular will still enjoy the same levels of patient trust, credibility and respect that they have, that they have at present. The maintenance of professionalism in medicine remains the responsibility of each and every doctor on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that medicine remains a proud and respected profession well into the future. It is interesting to note that recently the issue of professionalism has become fashionable with statements from both uh, Jeremy Hunt, Secretary of State, and the General Medical Council. In a recent speech, Mr. Hunt identified the importance of improving morale amongst medical, medical staff and highlighted three approaches. Piloting a modern version of the firm, reviewing and simplifying appraisal and revalidation, and introducing formal mentoring. These are welcome initiatives relating to professionalism and must be taken forward. The GMC in their recent document, Medical Professionalism Matters, have underlined the importance of including aspects of professionalism in the undergraduate cur curriculum, of partnerships with patients, of ensuring a supportive and compassionate culture, and of allowing time for lifelong learning uh, in, in job planning, all of which I would support and are issues which I have included in this talk. Let us hope that these aspirations are acted upon. Finally, in putting this lecture together, I decided to take a blank sheet of paper and a stiff glass of good malt whiskey and after reflection give myself the task of writing down what I consider to be the three most profound changes which I believe have occurred in medical professionalism during the time I have been a professor of surgery, which is now over 35 years. For what it is worth, I suggest these three are possibly the most monumental, but I hope you will not, I will not be accused of harking back to the so-called good old days of nostalgic professionalism. Firstly, the loss of collegiality in the workplace. No doctor's dining room, no hospital mess, disruption of the firm, loss of the apprentice system for junior staff and medical students, no dedicated secretary. Many would say this is a good thing. It was far too elitist, but I'm not so sure. I think it has adversely affected good communication between colleagues and produced a number of problems uh, which I've described. Secondly, increasing managerial control with more and more guidelines the danger of loss of accountability, time-consuming, oppressive appraisal and revalidation, but who is actually in charge of the patient? And finally, the introduction, almost imperceptibly, of shift working, in effect clocking on and clocking off, due not only to the introduction of the European Working Time Directives, but also to the New Deal and the new consultant and junior doctor contracts, and I'll make no further comment on this issue. Despite all this, let us hope that future generations of doctors will embrace the very principles on which medicine has stood for centuries. The maintenance of trust, the maintenance of integrity, compassion, and a degree of altruism. In other words, the maintenance of true professionalism. Thank you.